Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Acts, chapter 2, Acts 2. I want to welcome you to week number 2 of our series, Basic Training 2016. As I considered what the Lord might want our emphasis, our focus to be in this new year, one of the thoughts that kept coming to my mind, and one phrase that really kept coming to my mind was the basics. I really believe that this year the Lord wants us to spend much time just really together talking about those things which are foundational, not just to the, to the Christian life, but also to the life of of the church. The basics are important. In fact, the basics are the foundation of success for any person, organization, or team, including the church. Now, the reason coaches spend so much time teaching the basics is because they understand the basics are the foundation of success. Um, I know some of you probably watched football uh, yesterday. Um, my wife had to suffer through it. Uh, yesterday for at least three hours. Um, didn't watch quite as much of the second game as I did the first uh, because I had a vested interest in the first game. Um, but I did watch the ending uh, of, the, of the second game. And if you saw that game, then you know that Cincinnati had that game won. Uh, it was their game. Uh, there was only like a minute something left. All they had to do was hold on to the ball, run the clock out, maybe get a first down. Uh, but that was it. Basic football. Hold on to the ball. What happened? Got the ball. Pittsburgh gets the ball back. Pittsburgh ends up winning the game. Uh, there's something to be said about the basics of football. But more importantly, there's something to be said about the basics of the Christian. The strength of every good team is found in how well they do the basics. And the same can be said about God's people, the church. Uh, one thing I know with certainty today is that the Lord wants his people, his church, to be strong and he wants us to be successful. And I believe that God wants us to come to understand in 2016 that much of our strength and much of our success is found in the basics. And so we are... Uh, Kicking off this, this new year with this series called Basic Training 2016, uh, where we look at those things which are foundational to, to our success as Christians and as a church. Last week, uh, we looked at the Bible. Today, we're going to look at the fellowship. And so, if you would stand with me as we read God's Word today, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse number 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Father, thank you today that we can come to this place to worship you, to open up your word. And I pray as we look at fellowship today that you would be our teacher and that our lives would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you were a child in the 70s, or 80s, and I know the show actually goes back to the 60s, it may go back to the 50s, I don't know, but I know it goes back at least to the 60s, but if you were a child in the 70s and 80s, then I know that there's a good possibility that you were a fan of the TV show Gilligan's Island. Any fans represent today? Huh? This makes you want to break out and sing the theme song, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, uh, that's a show that I love watching as a, as a little, little boy. Uh, two crew members, five passengers, uh, boarded the SS Minnow for a three-hour tour. Uh, 
but as you well know, it ended up getting caught in a tropical storm, it got shipwrecked on some uncharted uh, island in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, there they uh, spent their days trying to get off of that island. Well, the show was hilarious. And it was hilarious in large part because of the unique and the different personalities of each of the castaways. You had the skipper. I mean, he was smart. He was fearless. Uh, he knew how to take charge uh, of the group when need be. Uh, you had the hounds uh, who were filthy rich. And uh, they knew how to handle anything that was uh, business oriented. You had the professor. Uh, he could figure out how to fix any problem with one of his inventions. He just couldn't figure out how to get him off uh, of the island. Uh, you had Mary Ann. She was the comforter. She was the encourager. She was the one always ready with a coconut pie uh, for, who, for whoever was uh, filling down. And then there was Ginger. Uh, Ginger could act and she could get them out of whatever jam they were in with whoever was uh, visiting the island. But out of all of them, you had Gilligan. Gilligan had a servant's heart. Uh, he would do anything for anyone, and he would usually mess things up in the process. But it was always done with a great heart. You know, Gilligan's Island is a great picture of what fellowship is all about. Different people coming together as one to share life together for a common purpose. The seven people on Gilligan's Island, they were all different. But they had one common goal, and that was to get off the island. You know, the fellowship that we see among those on Gilligan's Island is the kind of fellowship that we see among those in the early church. Look again at what Luke writes. We, we, we discover here in Acts 2 that, that one of the basics of the early church, one of the basics of early Christianity was that of fellowship. Uh, Luke writes there in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Uh, the Greek word that Luke uses here for fellowship is a word that means community, partner, sharer in common interest. It's a word that implies closeness. It's a word that implies intimacy. You know, in the 21st century church, we think of fellowship simply as sharing a meal together. I mean, that's kind of what we think of when we think of fellowship. Um, it's that, but it's more than that. Fellowship is sharing life together. For a common purpose, and that purpose is the advancement of the kingdom of God. Uh, you think about a community. You know, we, we live, some of you live in the community of Springfield. Some of you live in the community of Willard. Um, I live in the community of Republic. We're all very different people. We come from very different backgrounds, but we all kind of share a common purpose as a community. And, and the same is true with the church. We are a community. We are a fellowship. We are, we are different, and yet we, we share life together for a common purpose as a church, and that purpose is the advancement of the kingdom of God on this earth. And so if we're ever going to be the people, if we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, then we have to be a people that's devoted to a life of fellowship with other believers. And so what are the components of community? If we're going to be a people about fellowship, what's it all about? Well, verse 44 gives us the answer. I want you to look again at what Luke writes about the early believers. He says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. And so if we're going to be a community, if we're going to be a people all about fellowship, then we have to understand that fellowship is all about togetherness and commonness. And so let's look first at togetherness. Luke says, all the believers were together. In other words, Luke is telling us that it was the custom of the early believers to spend time with each other. They weren't people who tried to do life alone, but rather they were people who did life all together. Nowhere 
in the New Testament is there ever any teaching that encourages a believer to isolate themselves from other believers? And yet, how many times in our current culture do we hear a believer say, I don't have to be part of the church? Going to church doesn't make me a Christian. You ever heard that? That's something that's said a lot in our culture. I don't have to be a part of the church. Going to church doesn't make me a Christian. That's true. And you know, while it's true that going to church doesn't make one a Christian, it is also true that the church is made up of Christians. In the New Testament, the word ecclesia, or ecclesia, is used several times. It's used uh, 79 times. Okay? 79 times it's used in the New Testament, most often to represent a local community or fellowship of believers. Only a few times in the New Testament is ecclesia used to describe the universal church. The emphasis of the New Testament is given to local church fellowship. You know, we like, to, we like to look at the church in broad terms, but Jesus gets very specific, and he looks at it in very specific local terms. And so we can conclude, if, if, if most of the New Testament, when it's talking about ecclesia, it's, it's talking about a local church fellowship, we can conclude that God is teaching us that when we become a Christian, we are also to become a part of a local church fellowship. In other words, to accept Christ is to accept our place in the church. Part of being a believer in Christ is spending time with other believers of Christ in the context of a local church fellowship. Amen. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day, capital letter, the day, in other words, the day of Christ's return, and all the more as you see the day of Christ's return approaching, we need to be together. If we're going to become the person that God wants us to be, if we're going to do the things that God wants us to do to advance the kingdom of God, then we have to spend time with each other as believers. You know, the devil knows how important it is that we spend time with other believers. We might not understand how important it is, but I want to tell you something. The devil, he understands how important it is for us to spend time with other believers. And that is why he fights so hard against us and why he tries to get us to isolate ourselves from other believers. The, 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 the devil understands the importance of fellowship. And God wants us as his people to understand the importance of of fellowship. He wants us to understand how important it is that we are together. The devil might try to keep us apart, but we belong together. Now, there are three things I want us to notice about the togetherness of the early church. First, I want us to notice when they were together. Luke writes in verse 46, every day they continued to meet together. In other words, the early believers didn't just limit their time together to a couple hours one day on the Sabbath. They were with each other often. You know, it's important for us to understand that the fellowship of believers is not just about being in this place together. True fellowship requires more than just an hour or two together in this place. The fellowship of believers is about being people who share life together daily. I want you to hear this today, church. Fellowship is not an event. Fellowship is a lifestyle. But so often we view fellowship as an event. It's something we come to one or two hours a week. It's an event. But God wants us to see, and the early church gives us the example, that fellowship is not an event. 
Fellowship is a lifestyle. It's sharing life together on a daily basis. And so when were they together? Often. Every day. I want you to notice where they were together. Luke writes in verse 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. One of the places the early believers spent time together was in the temple. They worshiped together. They learned together there. You know, coming together in this place as believers is important. We should never underestimate what God is able to do in our life as we come together in this place with other believers to sing praise to God, to study the precepts of God, and to shout our petitions to God. But I want you to notice that the temple wasn't the only place the early believers spent time together. Luke also writes in verse 46, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. See, another place early believers spent time together was in their homes. There they ate together with extreme joy and sincerity of heart. And all the Baptists said, Amen. Amen. You know, coming together inside these walls is important. We just talked about how important it is that we worship together, that we that we learn together, that we sing together, shout together, study together. We should never underestimate just how important it is to come to this place, but we have to, have to also understand coming together outside these walls is also important. Being part of the church is not just about coming together in a building, but about building a life together. Being part of a church is not just about coming together in a building. It's about building a life together. The early church, they didn't just come together inside the walls of the temple. No, they built a life together outside the walls. That's what fellowship is about. It's about what happens inside this place, but it's also about what happens outside of this place. And so as believers, we need to spend time with each other in other places besides here. Let me ask, just ask you, when was the last time you ate with another believer besides here? When was the last time you spent time doing something fun? Because we know, we know how much fun we have when we come here. But, but, but when was the last time that you spent time doing something fun with someone, with another believer, besides here? You know, it doesn't have to be in your home. It can be anywhere. But when was the last time that you did something with another believer, another member of this church fellowship, outside the walls of this place? Because fellowship isn't just about being here and doing life here. It's, it's about doing life outside the walls of this place. The point is that we should be spending time with other believers outside of this place. Fellowship is about being together here, there, and really everywhere. And so, when did they come together? Where did they come together? In the temple, in their homes. Why? Why were they together? Well, if you go through the New Testament, you will discover the early believers, they came together really for a variety of reasons, and we don't honestly have the time to mention all of them. But let me just name a few. They were together to pray. They were together to witness. They were together to study. They were, they were together to worship. They were together to encourage. They were together to share, to rejoice, to weep, to eat, to laugh, to fight. When I say that, I don't mean with each other. 
were together to fight the enemy together. They stood beside one another and they, they fought the enemy together. They were together to give and on and on we could go about why the believers were together. The point is, is that they were together for a purpose. They didn't try to, to, to live life alone, but they lived life together. Rick Warren, he once put it this way, and I really like this. The Bible says we are put together, joined together, built together, members together, heirs together, fitted together, held together, and we will be caught up together and spend eternity together. Amen. So fellowship is all about togetherness. But it's also about commonness. Luke writes in verse 44, all the believers were together and they had everything in common. Now when Luke tells us that they had everything in common, does that mean the early believers were all alive? When you read the first part of Acts 2, you discover that those who were saved on the day of Pentecost, they were from every nation under heaven. The early believers, they were a very diverse group of people, just like we're a very diverse group of people. And yet they, they had unity despite their diversity. The Greek word that Luke uses here for common is koinos. It's a word very similar to the Greek word for fellowship, which is koinonia. Remember the word fellowship? What it means? It means share in common interest. And so when Luke says the early believers had everything in common, he was emphasizing once again the commonness that they shared in Jesus Christ. What held the early believers together in unity was their commonness in Christ Jesus. Listen to what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. He says, make every effort, every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. As different as we might be as believers. There's only one Lord. Amen. And in him, we who are many, were one. Our commonness is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so what do we have in common as believers in Jesus Christ? First, we have a common story. Regardless of how different we might be in some ways, the reality is that all who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior have a common story. That story being that we have been saved from the penalty and the power of sin by the grace of God. That a day came in our life when we admitted that we had sinned against God, believed Jesus Christ took our place on the cross and died for our sin, and confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And as a result, no longer are we dead in our trespasses and sin, but we're alive in Jesus Christ. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and now we have an eternal hope and an eternal home to look forward to. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be different, but we have a common story in Jesus Christ. Amen. But not only do we have a common story, we also have a common calling. Every believer in Jesus Christ has been called to preach the good news to all creation. To go and make disciples of all nations. When Jesus called us to follow him. When he said, hey, hey Travis, follow me. And when that happened in your life, when that, when that day came when Jesus called out to us to follow him, we received the same calling that Peter and Andrew received when Jesus called them. Matthew 4, 18 and 19 says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. Every follower of Jesus Christ has the calling to cast our, our gospel nets into the sea of sin so that men can be rescued and reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
We have a common calling. If you know Jesus today, understand you've got a calling on your life. What's that calling? To rescue those who are lost. But the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's your calling. You've got a story to share with people. I don't have a story. You have a story. Every person in this, in this room has a story. We just talked about it. It's a common story. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And it's all because of the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. He is the one who reached down, and he's the one who lifted me up out of the sea of sin, and he saved me eternally. You have a story to tell. I've got a story to tell. We all have a common calling to preach the good news. And isn't it good news, ladies and gentlemen? That's right. Isn't it good news? Have you ever heard any news any greater than the gospel of Jesus Christ? And yet, how often is that the news that we keep to ourselves the most? <laughs> I mean, there's things that happen, you know, in all of our lives. There'll be good things that happen. We can hardly wait to text or, or get on Facebook or pick up the phone or just go to somebody's house and say, I've got good news to share with you. This happened in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got good news. Good news. That really makes an eternal difference. Some of the things I share, the good news that I share with other people, it, it has no effect on eternity at all. No, the gospel. Power is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have a common story. We have a common calling. And finally, we have a common goal. As believers in Jesus Christ, we all have a common goal. What is that common goal? The advancement of the kingdom of God on this earth. According to Jesus, one of the main focuses of our prayer life is to be the coming of the kingdom of God on this earth. You remember what Jesus Said when he taught the disciples, the disciples came to him and they said, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? And so Jesus, he, he takes them and he models for them what prayer is to look like. And in Matthew 16, 6, 10, Jesus said, we are to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The goal of the believer's life is not to advance our kingdom. but to advance the kingdom of God. It's a common goal that all believers share. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus told Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's right. I mean, if that's not a, if that's not a word that we don't need to cling to today in this, in this day and time. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God is building his church. He's building his church to be on the offensive against the gates of hell, to take ground for the kingdom of God on this earth. We have a common goal. Unfortunately, so many times we get sidetracked, don't we? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm easily sidetracked sometimes. Are you easily sidetracked? <laughs> sometimes we are sidetracked as the church because instead of focusing on the common goal we have we focus on the differences we have on how to accomplish that goal we focus on the methods we focus on the styles the programs we allow those things to divide us to the point that we don't accomplish anything towards the actual goal We have a common goal, and we need to weigh everything that we do as a church against that common goal, and not according to the differences we have in preference and opinion. Not what we want to hear, right? The reason the early church was able to get so much done for the kingdom of God because they didn't spend all their time focusing on the differences that divided them. They focused on, they focused on the things that, that they shared in common in Jesus Christ. The things that unified them. Amen. I want to know why 
find the church of the 21st century so powerless to get anything done? I'll tell you why. It's because we, fit, we spend all of our time and all of our energy and all of our efforts focusing on the things that divide us. Our preferences, our styles, what we like, instead of focusing on the kingdom of God and the common story and the common calling and the common goal that we all have in Jesus Christ. Right. And until we begin to be like the early church and understand what fellowship is, that fellowship isn't just simply coming and, and, and eating a meal in our fellowship hall. But it's about focusing on what we have in common in Jesus Christ. Spending time together. Listen. Focusing on that, the commonness that we have in Jesus Christ. Until we begin to understand the importance of fellowship, we as a church will continue to be powerless to do much. What's going to matter in all eternity? What's going to matter, church? Is the program going to matter? Is the style going to matter? Is the preference going to matter? Or is what the, what's going to matter is, is that a life was eternally changed with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to matter. Amen. You know, the youth could hardly believe. A couple weeks ago, we were talking about, I think we might have been talking about gifts. We've been talking about gifts the last two weeks, right? You have seen their eyes, and I had to tell them that there are nations sending missionaries to the United States of America. We used to be the nation the only really sending nation that there was. We'd send people to other nations, but now because the world looks at our lostness and our darkness, the world is now sending missionaries to us. What does that say about the church in America? We're focusing on the wrong things. But I want to tell you, God will use whoever he can use to bring light to the United States. If it won't be the church in America, he'll bring somebody else to make sure that light is here. But I would suggest that we become the light that God wants us to become by focusing on the things that God wants us to focus on. Strong churches are strong in fellowship. And so fellowship, it's about togetherness, it's about commonness. I want, more than anything, for us as a church to be strong and successful. But in order for that to happen, we have to give ourselves to being a people of fellowship. A fellowship that's about togetherness and a fellowship that's about commonness. A fellowship that's basic to our strength and our success. I just want to encourage you, instead of, instead of looking for every reason not, Habits of the of the 21st century church are exactly what Hebrews is talking about. We are living that. Let us not get in the habit of not meeting together. Let's be in the habit of coming together, focusing on those things that we have in common so that we can truly. One day, all of us are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to give him a count for what we did with the life that he gave us. What we did stewards of the life that he gave us. Did we take the opportunities that God gave us to be the people that he wants us to be? And we'll do it alone. There won't be anybody standing beside us. And so at the end of the day, we all just have to Get with God and say, God, what, what could I do? What, what needs to change in my, my life in order that I can help make Orchard Crest Baptist Church stronger and better? 
What needs to change in my life? What priorities need to change in my life in order that, that I can help this church be stronger and better? And only to be answering that question. Whenever the Holy Spirit reveals to you, I want to encourage you to act upon it. So I didn't just call us to hear the Word of God today. I called us to act upon the Word of God. I called us to be doers of the Word. Some of you have been here a long time, haven't you? <coughs> Some of you, 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 there's a few of you left. You've been here from day one. And I think that you would say that God didn't just place this church here by accident. It was, it was by divine appointment. God has a purpose for this people being in this place. But the key is that God has a purpose. It's His church. And He knows what makes it to the strength and success of every local church. So I pray that we will join our hearts with his heart. That we'll be strong in fellowship so that we can be a strong church in 2016. I want to ask that everybody just bow their heads and close their eyes. Everybody